everyone. This is Nicole Testa Boston um, with FIATAC. And I wanted to welcome all of you to our morning's uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Brilakis, who will be speaking about his research um, on a path for automating construction assessment and maintenance. Um, before we do that, though, and I introduce him, I'd like to go ahead and just share with you a little bit about the system. If this is your first time using GoToMeeting, um, the toolbar, as you see on your screen, is unique to you. So at any time, you can click that orange arrow on the um, Grab tab and minimize that off your screen. Uh, you will also note that you're on a defaulted mute setting, and that's due to the number of attendees on the call. Uh, however, we do welcome participation and questions and, and uh, points you might want clarification on. And you can do that by typing in using the questions tab on your toolbar. Uh, just go there and type those, type those in. Those will go directly to me. And um, we've reserved a few minutes at the end of the hour um, to answer those questions. And I will facilitate that with our speaker. Uh, I also wanted to let everyone know we will be recording this session, both the audio and the PowerPoint slides, and we will be making them available on our fiatech.org website later this week. It usually gives, takes a day or two for us to get that up and loaded, um, but you will be able to get a link and share that with colleagues or review it later at your leisure. Uh, with that, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Giannis Bulakis. Um, he did receive the outstanding um, outstanding Early Career Researcher Award at our SETI Awards Gala this past uh, April in Doral at the um, Fiatech Technology Conference um, for all the work that he has done over the years. He's currently an assistant professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He completed his doctorate in civil engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And he's the Director of Construction Information Technology Laboratory and a recipient of the NSF Career Award and the 2009 ASCE Associate Editor Award. Um, Dr. Berlakis is an author of 30 peer-reviewed journal papers and 60 conference papers, an Associate Editor of the ASCE Construction Engineering and Management, ASCE Computing and Civil Engineering, and Elsevier Advanced Engineering Informatics Journals. He's also the chair of the ASCE TCCIT Data Sensing and Analysis and TRB Information Systems in Construction Management commi um, Committees. Um, so we're very um, happy to have Dr. Berlakis here to share with us the research that he's been doing. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you, Giannis. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. So uh, today I'll be talking about my path for how I plan to help automate construction assessment and maintenance. But before I talk about the path, I'd like to say a few things about why I chose that path. The National Academy of Engineering came up with a very interesting report in 2008 on the engineering grand challenges for the 21st century. One of those uh, grand challenges is restoring and improving urban infrastructure. And as part of that, there were two major, major issues one being the lack of viable methods to map and label existing infrastructure. If you think about it, over the past hundred years and more, we've been building and building and building in all the developed countries. We have created a lot of infrastructure, but for all practical purposes, we have very little electronic record of what is actually out there. For example, if you want to uh, convert a real-world infrastructure into a geometric model, into the building information as built. Two-thirds of the effort needed to do that is actually spent on converting raw data into that geometric model. The result is that these processes are very expensive. They don't provide enough end value, and so we don't produce those as built models for the most new and retrofit construction which leads to rework and design changes that have an impact on the cost as well as on the sustainability of the facility. The other issue that's mentioned in that report, the other challenge, is how do we actually build better infrastructure? We have, most of our construction methods have been around for decades, if not centuries. And as you can see, the report says that novel construction materials may in fact help address 
some of these challenges, however, dramatic progress may only be possible by coming up with completely new ways to do things. And as part of that, advances in computer science and robotics should help us make automation possible in construction. This is the area that I'm working in, and particularly this is the things that I have been doing throughout my career, as well as things I plan to do. Uh, this is also my uh, uh, NSF career award. When I first started my research, I uh, started working on infrastructure materials recognition, and then gradually added shape information to be able to detect and recognize infrastructure objects. The reason for that is that if I can detect such objects in raw data, that means I can automatically measure their size. For example, being able to automatically measure the dimensions of roofs or the volume of excavation for SQL geometric modeling as designed as build comparisons and other purposes. If I can recognize objects, that means I can count how many I can see, meaning automatically counting bricks, doors, workers, trucks, and so on for productivity measuring and sustainability monitoring. If I can recognize objects, it also means that I can track them in space, in which case I can track materials, personnel, and equipment in construction sites, as well as vehicles on the highway for project monitoring systems and congestion control systems. And last but not least, if I can recognize objects, then I can look into those objects and start detecting the defects on them, such as the cracks, the air pockets, spiling potholes, and so on for structural damage assessment as well as maintenance decision making. Today I will show you a medley of these topics with some examples from each area starting from the first one going on to objects recognition and then some of the use cases for measuring the size of objects, tracking as well as detecting defects. So let's move into the first one. Uh, this is a uh, project that was actually started by a company called W.E. O'Neill in uh, Chicago who came to us and said that the biggest problem we have with pictures is that we cannot find them. Uh, we give our site engineers those tiny digital cameras, they go out on the field, they start uh, shooting as they see fit, uh, then they dump those pictures in their company database and gradually over time you start putting together thousands of pictures for every project. The problem is that at some point, when you actually need to use one of those pictures, finding the one you want is a very big problem. And classifying those pictures is such a big burden. So what we created for them is a method that actually looks into the picture, clusters all the materials in there, and represents those clusters with image processing algorithms into what I call a material signature. That signature is then compared with pre-classified samples of materials so that materials can be detected into the picture. And then that information is deposited into an image objects repository so that then you can simply click, do a right click onto your object in a building information model generate an object attributes query that includes the materials, month, year, location information, and then that information is compared with the attributes of the picture, and that gives you back all the pictures related to that object. Uh, here I have an example of the uh, prototype we have created. This is through a plugin for Microsoft Visio. You can simply load up an IFC file, right click on this wall object, go to our plugin that finds images and automatically in one step retrieve all the images for that particular uh, wall. Uh, this worked actually quite well. Uh, our materials recognition was quite sufficient for the purposes we were interested in and over time we have improved it and make it a lot more uh, robust. However, what I realized at the time is that if I add shape information to those materials, then I will not just be able to say that this picture has concrete. I will actually be able to say that I see over here a concrete column, over there a concrete beam, and so on. And that adds a lot more intelligence to the recognition. And that's where infrastructure objects recognition came up. Um, the main application for that, the main direct application, is in S-built modeling. 
And the reason for that is that the raw data, point clouds and images, have no knowledge of the elements they contain, what they're made of, what points belong to what entities, and obviously cannot provide any other information besides the spatial measurements. So this is why in many cases it's actually worth it to convert that raw data into an information-rich, S-built, object-oriented model. However, the way that we do this today, and I have here a screenshot from an application called PlantLinks, uh, who is a company that's actually doing this for industrial facilities. So the way we do this today is that people have to go to the field, laser scan the facility, bring that laser scan into their software, and then a person has to manually go in there and say that, for example, the points that you see in this region look like a concrete column to me, so he needs to go into his database, find the column object, drag and drop it here. Then there is a resize algorithm that fits it into the data and then throws away the corresponding points. Now that process is not very cumbersome. The problem is that a facility like that can easily have 100,000 objects. So if you have to repeat that 100,000 times, as you can imagine, that becomes a very labor uh, expensive task. What we proposed to the National Science Foundation was that we, the researchers, can in fact gradually build a recognition model repository of models that will actually help us recognize the most frequent objects that we find in those seats, ranging from structural elements to uh, piping, electrical, mechanical, and so on, so that we can automatically recognize the majority of the frequent items and allow the modelers to only do the specialty items uh, by themselves. This way we can eventually save at least 50 to 80 percent of the time of the modeler. Um, I won't go into the details of that in the interest of time. I'll be happy to answer questions on that. I'd just like to show one example of a uh, recognition model we created for columns detection. Uh, we have been able to detect columns with that very reliably from just a webcam and a laptop in real time, both for damaged and undamaged cases, for earthquakes and so on. And I will actually show you some videos of these results at the end of this presentation that encompasses all the results together. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to quickly move into the second uh, topic, uh, in fact, third topic on measuring the size of objects. Now, if I want to measure the size of objects, obviously I need 3D data. But to get adequate and accurate data can be a costly thing by itself. First of all, the devices can be expensive. Laser scanners, in fact, have a significant price tag. Second of all, the labor costs can be significant, uh, both for data collection as well as the post-processing man hours that may have to be spent afterwards in stitching together either point clouds or images for photogrammetry and so on. The result, the result is that in most cases we don't do it. Yes, we use these devices, but for many small and medium-sized projects, we just don't find enough value to go into that process, let alone doing this process frequently throughout the construction phase. I started looking into potential technologies that can help us do that in a very cheap and effective manner. And one uh, technology I came across with is short-range mobile videogrammetry. This is an existing technology that's been around for some years. And the way it works is that there is a person holding the device, a device just like the one that you see here, and scanning an object in real time. Uh, the benefit of this technology is that, first of all, it's very cheap because it only involves very low-cost cameras, so you can put together something like this for under $1,000. It's very fast because it actually works in real time and gives you the results right on the spot. And it's also interactive because by looking at the results, you can go back and fix the parts that you think are not adequately covered. To me, this was a great thing. I started thinking, imagine if I can grab this thing and start videotaping a building and getting the point cloud in real time. Wouldn't that be great? The problem is that these devices only work for a distance of about a foot. 
and you can obviously not scan a building for such a short range. The other problem is that they don't work very well for poorly textured environments. So if you have a white wall with almost no features on that, this device won't be able to capture much for you. So we started thinking exactly how can we resolve this problem to be able to use those benefits in our domain. Uh, basically how can we solve the accuracy problem uh, in this case. And so what we proposed uh, to NSF and got a project to test was that we can in fact fix this problem by in addition to just using points for the reconstruction of the 3D, we also use lines and planes. Now, I don't want to go into the details of the algorithms, but very quickly I can tell you that our method works by detecting all kinds of features, both point, line, and plane features, and then matching them using the scriptors that allow us to match those features across several video frames, so that then we can infer the motion of the camera set, as well as the structure on the environment, using the recognized features in each frame. Uh, long story short, we uh, implemented that and we tested that on real construction sites, in fact, here at Georgia Tech. And we were able from just a simple set of two camcorders from a range of 25 meters away from the construction site, get an average error of under half a centimeter, which to us is already a big uh, achievement. In addition to that, we presented that information uh, in several industry forums and uh, one uh, of the companies that uh, participated in those forums called Metal Forming realized that this has a lot of potential in their area. So we started working with them for uh, roof surveying purposes. Basically what this company does is that they have this uh, trailer that you see here that you can fit it with sheet metal either a CAD file and it prints out the pieces that you see up here that go on top of these roofs. However, in order to create those CAD files, people have to go up on these roofs and measure all of these dimensions, which is both a very unsafe profession as well as a very labor intensive profession. If instead we can do that with video measuring, we can in fact save significant costs in the roofing industry. And so we did exactly that. We uh, modified our methods to be able to get the wireframes of roofs and eventually we were able to get the results that you see here. Uh, our tests were done. The ground truth was collected with uh, total stations to compare with and from a range of 15 meters away from a roof we can get an average error of under a centimeter and of course we keep improving that and we um, have created a startup company to commercialize this technology and bring it very soon to the roofing sector. Now in addition to this work, uh, we've also worked on another very novel concept that is funded by the National Science Foundation on uh, reciprocal reconstruction and recognition. Basically if we merge together, if we, if we fuse our ability to recognize objects with our ability to reconstruct and get the 3D information from the field, that means we can create more robust recognition as well as more robust reconstruction by having basically one algorithm feed off the other. And I will show you some results of that later on. I don't want to spend time on the details. Uh, I do want to show an intermediate result we came up with that may be of interest to you, which is a comparison of existing uh, reconstruction technologies. You can see here we compare as part of this project uh, Photosynth, Photofly and other photogrammetric approaches uh, against our method on videogrammetry using two different cameras, a cheap camcorder, Canon Vixia as well as a more expensive camera and again with laser scanning. And you can see from the result that if you are prepared to pay for the cost of a scanner, of course you're going to get a much lower error rate, more completeness, more density, and finishing a generally reasonable amount of time. If instead you cannot afford to do that and you are satisfied with a lower error rate, uh, sorry, with a higher error rate, 
in that case, it is clear that videogrammetric approaches are in fact better than photogrammetric approaches and can give you, as you can see, both a lower error, a higher completeness, more density, as well as finish on average faster simply because all you have to do is swipe the video across your object. In addition to that, just very briefly I'd like to mention that all of this work is not possible by just one person. Uh, I have been working on this subject with several experts in computer vision, stereo vision, machine learning and so on. And this is happening through a consortium that has been set up uh, with our European partners from Forth, the University of Cyprus, as well as Technion, uh, as well as the University of Michigan here in the U.S. And uh, this consortium has also been funded from the European Commission to exchange their students exactly for this purpose, to be able to go from a simple videotape all the way to a building information model and coordinate our efforts. Moving on to tracking of objects, uh, I think this is also a very interesting subject. On the tracking topic, I think Fiatech has a lot of expertise and there are many companies involved with tracking. So I think that this should be uh, very familiar to you. Uh, spatial monitoring of resources, of course, is possible today with a variety of radio frequency technologies from RFID to ultra wideband to GPS and others. And these technologies are really excellent, both for identification and for tracking of certain material and equipment types. They are, of course, the best solution for many projects. However, in certain cases, and particularly when you have a large-scale congested site, they can be quite a burdensome solution. And the reason is that once you scale up, it actually becomes inefficient to have to tag thousands of materials and hundreds of equipment and personnel because even the tagging process by itself creates a very high IT overhead. If you consider the process of deploying the tags, maintaining the tags, decommissioning the tags, and so on. The other issue is privacy. Uh, we conducted some case studies here in Atlanta on uh, a uh, Western hotel, and we noticed that some workers that simply did not want to be tracked would peel off the tag, stick it to the wall, work for eight hours, then come back, put the tag back in the hard hat, and leave the hard hat on the side. And I understand that. That's reasonable. People don't like to feel that there is a sensor right above their heads following them around. So we started thinking, well, how can we address that problem? How can we find an alternative way to uh, be able to track efficiently without being very intrusive as well as uh, without having to tag all these entities and have all those tagging costs? Uh, the idea came from actually from soccer games. Um, if you think about a soccer game, it's pretty much very similar to a construction site. You have a large field with a lot of people in it that are moving and doing certain things. Uh, right now, at the end of a soccer game, you can in fact automatically see all the statistics of the players, including how many miles those players run. And I was surprised in the beginning, I, I couldn't quite understand how they would figure out the exact miles that every person run in the regular path they would follow in the field. But then I realized that, in fact, this all happens with vision tracking. And the good thing with vision tracking is, first of all, there is no tags. You can track from very far away without having to put anything on a person. Second, a single camera can easily track 50 to 100 objects. So you can track 100 items with really just two or three cameras in a situation like that. And third, it can work very well with construction cameras that already exist on the field today. However, the problem of vision tracking is that someone has to manually mark the entity to be tracked. Okay, someone has to say what is interesting. We cannot track anything that's out there because we don't want to track the uh, leaves of the trees moving or the butterflies or the birds. We want to track very particular items. And so the question that we try to answer is how can we mark the interesting objects in a construction site automatically and track them in 3D? 
this is the solution we came up with and we proposed to NSF several years back where we would have from any video of a construction camera on the side, we would get that video frame uh, and automatically look into the frame, detect any new objects with the methods that we've discussed before as well as some new things I will show you. Then send that to a 2D tracker who will track it across space, compute the centroid, and once you can view that object from two or more locations, then you can triangulate and find its 3D coordinates. Now, specifically for the detection part, we uh, created an approach that uses the principle of motion, shape, color, meaning we start with motion. Anything that is moving, we automatically detect it with background subtraction algorithms. And once that happens, we then use uh, shape recognition algorithms to find what is a, a human being versus what is a piece of equipment and so on. And then we use color information to distinguish between humans what is the person actually wearing safety gear, therefore a worker, versus let's say a pedestrian that's simply crossing the street behind the side. And same thing for equipment, given that equipment are typically brightly colored so we can use that to our advantage. The result is what you can see here. We tested, first of all, several tracking algorithms to see which one performs the best for construction sites. We did lighting tests, meaning what if it's too bright, what if it's too dark, which algorithm performs the best. Uh, we, we did several occlusion tests. If 25% of the object is occluded, can I keep tracking it? If 50% is occluded, if 75% and so on. And from that, we determined that kernel-based tracking is in fact the most effective for construction. We also did tests for the workers' recognition that I mentioned before. And we can in fact track workers very reliably and recognize who is wearing a safety vest and who, who is not. Uh, basically, any person that enters the view within maximum half a second, we will have detected that person and then we can track him throughout the process on the site. We also did that for equipment recognition. You can see here the red uh, square is our method, blue is just regular tracking. We're able to outperform regular tracking in almost every situation simply because with by adding detection we can re-recognize an object when an occlusion happens and then goes away. Uh, same thing for when the object makes turns and so on. And last but not least, I have results on 3D tracking which can show that we can in fact track an object just as reliably as a GPS tag without any uh, flaws on that. Um, the data we collected to do that was collected uh, back in uh, 2008. Uh, before the crisis when there was still a lot of construction going on in Greece. We had sent several students and they collected several terabytes of data. So we have in fact done very large scale validation on this. And we've also expanded this research into traffic flow monitoring uh, simply because traffic flows in a much more structured way and it's a much easier problem to tackle. So we are able today to count vehicles on a highway. We can compute trajectories of those vehicles, as well as uh, automatically uh, measure the speeds of the vehicles as they are traveling and get comparable numbers with GPS, as well as calculate uh, all other characteristics of uh, traffic. Beyond that, last but not least, I will talk a little bit about detecting object defects. Um, on this field, um, I would like to focus on just one of the projects we've done, and that has to do with automated structural damage assessment. A couple of years back, I went to Haiti together with structural engineers to witness myself the process of inspecting damaged buildings. And what I realized is that that process, if you really want to do it well, can be a very time-consuming and cumbersome process. If you look at this slide, you can see that a inspector using these tables would have to go and measure, for example, the widths of the cracks, the length of the spout region, and other characteristics 
so that he can identify the damage level of a particular member and use that to determine the condition of a building. However, measuring those dimensions can in fact be a very cumbersome process and if you consider how many cracks can be on a damaged column, uh, spiling and so on. And uh, the result is that in practice it easily takes two or three people half a day to do, for example, just a single school facility. If you project that across time, if you think about all the uh, buildings that can be damaged from an earthquake and the demand, the inspection demand that is created at the time of the earthquake, the result is that it takes weeks and months to assess all these structures, during which time emergency responders have to risk their lives to enter unsafe buildings and people have to stay out of their homes and businesses waiting for the assessment. Our objective in this particular research was to try to shift the research focus from accuracy, which is typically what structural engineering researchers do, to speed. Basically, how can I get the same accuracy but get those measurements automatically? And the uh, approach we proposed to NSF and we uh, got a project to work on this and validate it is we simply add a camera to the hard hat of the first responder or the inspector who as the first responder goes in and is looking for people to rescue the camera at the same time is looking for columns to assess and once we detect a column from that visual data with methods that I've mentioned already before we then look into all the damage that exists on that column and once we recognize that, we use that information to assess the condition of that member and then use that as we do more and more members to eventually assess the condition of the entire structure and warn the user of the condition of the building. Here you can see some of the results, uh, both from uh, uh, cracks measurements in terms of orientation, uh, length and width. Uh, they're all within uh, well below manual measurement errors, as well as the exposed reinforcement detection performance for the purposes of recognizing the spalled region and particularly the length of the spalled region. That's all I have for you today uh, and uh, before I close I'd like to say that there is much left to do in this domain. There is a lot of research to be done and many more problems to be solved uh, once you can recognize infrastructure objects. And just as an example of that, I presented these projects to you today and I'd like to show you that video I promised with a medley of those results. I am not sure if you can see the video at this point. I hope you can. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, I, that's yes? Yes. Uh -huh, it's working. Okay. So what we see right now is real-time columns recognition I don't have the latest video, we fixed the jumping issue that you saw. This is the workers detection and tracking. You see we can separate those who are wearing vests versus those who are not. This is equipment tracking. Red is our method, blue is regular tracking. You will see now that a track passes by, we re-recognize that equipment and we maintain the tracking after that. This is vehicles tracking on the highway. Uh, which is the other application I mentioned. Uh, this is even potholes uh, detection for pavement assessment, another project we've been working on. And this is the uh, hydrogrammetric roof surveying project I mentioned, the one we're trying to commercialize at this point. Uh, you can see we detect the, uh, the lines on top of a roof. From those lines that we detect, we find only the perimeter lines. From the perimeter lines, we then detect the planes, and from the planes that are detected, then we measure the roof in centimeters. This is another project that we are doing with NSF, uh, where we simply use a camcorder, just a single camcorder, videotape a roof. From that, we automatically generate the point cloud, recognize the objects in that roof, and give you eventually the model of that facility. And I think that's the end of the video. Um, I'd like to close the presentation at this point and open the floor to questions. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Yanis. Um, for those of you who may be joined late, uh, if you do have questions or comments or want further information, you can use the questions tab on your toolbar there, um, and we can get those to our presenter and get some responses back. Um, I, I would just ask, what, what sort of um, partnerships are you seeing with um, private industry deploying and um, working with the academic and research communities on, on some of this? Well, in this particular work, what I have realized is that the, uh, the software industry that is most involved, companies like Autodesk, Bentley, and so on, um, are a little bit risk averse on the subject. And from all the discussions I've had, the uh, recommended approach is the creation of startup companies that will take this technology to the field prove that it can in fact become a profitable business and eventually be absorbed from one of the larger players in the field. And this is in fact exactly what we are trying to do with several of our technologies at this point. Um, thanks. Have you used this technology in BIM, Building Information Modeling Projects? And if so, um, how has it fared? Uh, we have been uh, using this primarily for S-Build Building Information Modeling, and um, this is part of our work with the International Consortium. Uh, the work I presented here relates primarily to my part, which is the recognition of these objects that go into the building information model. Uh, however, I can say that one of our partners, uh, Rafael Sachs from Technion University, is working on taking what we recognize and automatically uh, representing that with IFC schemas that are uh, appropriate for this particular purpose. However, given that this is not my area of expertise, I don't think I can talk intelligently about his part. Uh, thanks. Have you used this method for petrochemical plants? Um, and I guess just you know, broader question is uh, applicability in other industry sectors. Um, I think that particularly for s modeling, petrochemical plants is the number one target because that is exactly where s modeling can be most useful in. And this is why these kinds of plants pay today for companies to do this work manually. Uh, I think that this is exactly where we will be in the very near future. And then later on, once that is adopted from that industry, it hopefully will move on to other industries that have more simplified projects. The reasons for that is that the petrochemical industry has some of the most complex facilities and they have a very uh, significant need to my understanding for technologies that can help them manage that complexity and that's exactly where s -build, building information modeling can help them do a lot in. Uh, thanks. I guess another question. Another question here is: Once you have gathered that information, is it possible to reuse it in other software platforms or reload it? Uh, yes, and uh, this is exactly one of our uh, targets. That every information we generate, for example, the point clouds from video, we will generate that in any format that is popular or desirable by the user. And this includes uh, Autodesk formats, Bentley formats, IFC, and other formats. Uh, we, we have access to those schemas that will allow us to make that translation very easily. Uh, however, this is something that will happen as part of the development process that will follow on uh, through the startup company, uh, not at the research level, because there is little research value to that. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I do have several people who have typed in and, and said that they found this to be very fascinating and very impressive and are looking to see um, further development in this. Um, uh, we would like to have the know-how. Have you prepared some training um, is a question, I guess. Is there any um, way for people who want to pursue this to get training? perhaps contact well, first you? Of all, all of the results that you have seen have been uh, 
published in various formats, uh, from uh, magazine articles to ENR to uh, conference and journal papers. We are presenting this in several venues. Uh, training, I don't think we are actually there yet. Uh, but I think that once uh, the technology starts being commercialized, I think we'll definitely move into that subject very quickly. So I think that's probably a question that I would better be able to answer in about a year from now. But it's a good question. Okay. Well, I think that covers it for our questions right now. Like I said, there was quite a bit of interest in this. Of course, as soon as I say that, I get another question in, Giannis. <laughs> um, how much will implementation of this technology on a small to medium construction site cost? Um, that may or may not be a question you can answer right now. Actually, um, I can give you one example. In the case of uh, the diagrammetric surveying, uh, we are trying to bring the cost of let's say um, measuring an entire roof project to less than two hundred dollars. An uh, entire roof project for less than two hundred? Yes, the measuring part of that. So very reasonable. <laughs> and, and this is exactly the point uh, that uh, because the measuring process itself is very low in labor cost, all you have to do is videotape your roof, that's it. Uh, really, all the work happens automatically as server, so pricing can be anything that's obviously lower than doing it manually with people going up on those roofs. And again, that's just one of the examples. So one question here now, too, is what basic equipment will be needed in this regard? I mean, it sounds very minimal. In the case of outdoor large-scale measurements, uh, we have uh, produced and we are now patenting a uh, stereo camera set that uh, I think the startup will be selling for less than a thousand apiece, probably about six to eight hundred dollars. And that's more than enough for all the roofing projects. In the case of indoor uh, applications, we are in fact trying to convert that into an iPhone app. And the app itself is going to be free. So all you have to do is download the app swipe your iPhone video over the space you want to measure, send us the video, and we'll send you back the point cloud. Great. Um, how do architects and engineers, um, how are they able to integrate this into the construction documents for construction requirements? Um, I think that is a very interesting question and a big problem that we will need to solve. Uh, I'll be honest with you, we haven't started looking into that yet. At first, we want to make sure that this works, is reliable, and gets a good response from the industry. Once that is achieved, we will start looking into uh, adoption of the industry and how that relates to the documentation and so on. Uh, we have a few people who wanted to follow up with you directly. Is it all right if I give your contact information, or would you prefer we email it? Yes, of course. Uh, they can contact me anytime. Okay. I will send that out. Um, what is the biggest challenge for this technology that you're seeing right now? The biggest challenge uh, that I see is the fact that our domain construction has so much custom jobs, so, so much custom items that it, it really becomes very hard to address all, um, all the possible challenges at the same time. And this is why a lot of the work that we do is focused, for example, in the case of the roofs project on just roofs, or in the case of recognition on just the most frequent objects. Uh, this is generally a challenge with construction, unlike manufacturing where you know ahead of time what you expect to see. So you can customize your algorithms and you don't need the same level of intelligence to do that. This variability in construction adds a lot more complexity on the algorithmic side. But I think that's what we are here to do to solve these problems. Uh, can this be used to detect the underground geology so that you know exactly the underground conditions? 
if you do this with a ground penetrating radar and then from that try to do recognition of what are the conditions, definitely that's a case. We haven't tried that, but uh, the radar is simply just another uh, signal uh, source and you can process it just like you would with a picture or an audio signal. Are there any weather-related issues that can affect the accuracy of the system? Uh, we have tested some of these weather issues, such as the lighting conditions, if it's too bright, too dark, and so on. Generally, what we have found is that as long as your own eyes can see the objects, you are able to do that with the camera as well. So basically, the camera's limitations is the human being's eyes' limitations. Of course, if it's completely dark and you cannot see, the camera cannot see either. Uh, this person is wondering, in order to link the material information to the surfaces or objects, um, it would seem that you would need a huge database. What is the hardware characteristics needed? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you please read it back to me? Um, in order to link the material information to the surfaces or objects, you would seem to need a, a very large database. In, in which case, what, would, what kind of hardware um, would you need or use? The uh, S-Build models that are produced, the S-Build building information models, are of the same size as if someone were to do that process manually. Uh, so. I, I don't think that that part, in fact, uh, produces more data. Uh, the picture itself, the picture that gets overlaid on top of the model, is not uh, as much in terms of size. If, if we keep in mind that eventually we stitch all the video frames together and we only keep a medley of those frames, enough to cover those surfaces for, purely for rendering purposes. So I really don't see that as a challenge. Thank you. Um, how much will be the total cost to add, or approximate, I guess, to add the radar to your camera and do the underground detection without having to do boring and have a soils report that an engineer can use? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I don't know the answer. I will have to try that myself and uh, see how that works out. But that's certainly a very interesting research problem to look at. And someone wants to know if you've tried to use this in an asset management facilities management area. I think you uh, might have answered that earlier. Yeah, we, we are not there yet, basically. Yeah. Coming soon. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, if folks do have um, further questions, um, you can contact me, ntboston, at fiatech.org. We've also recorded this, and we'll be posting it on the fiatech.org website shortly. Um, so you can also get copies there. And I did send Dr. Um, Verlakis's, uh email out. Um, so if you do want to follow up with him, I know there were a few folks that wanted to talk to you about um, possibly speaking to their groups on this, too. So. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the hour um, and sharing this with us, Dr. Balakis, and You're congratulations welcome. on your awards. And I hope everyone has a great day, and thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.